Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone. And if you're a fan of our show, you'll know that we started this season with a four part series about one of the greatest female vocalists of all time, Helen Reddy. Our guest was the president of the official Helen Reddy fan club and Helen's dear friend, Jim Keaton. Well, today, Jim is back with a very special guest. She's the woman who brought Helen's story to the big screen and introduced her music to a whole new generation. She's the producer and director of the 2019 blockbuster hit, I Am Woman. This critically acclaimed movie received nine actor nominations and won an Aria Award for Best Original Soundtrack. And it's currently one of the most popular films showing on Netflix. Our guest is an award-winning Australian filmmaker who first came to our attention in 2012 with her stunning documentary about Tony Bennett. She is the wonderful Anju Moon. Anju and Jim, thank you both so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having us. We're glad to be here. And it's so great for Jim and I to be together on Helen's 80th birthday and to be speaking about her life. Anju, I must tell you as a Helen Reddy fan that I was overjoyed with this movie because you told Helen's story so authentically and with such integrity. Congratulations on such a magnificent film. Well, thank you. I feel very blessed that, and extremely lucky that I met Helen and that she entrusted me with her story. Anju, can you tell us what it was about Helen Reddy that made you want to make the film? Well, first of all, Anyone who's a Helen Reddy fan knows the impact that she's had. But for me, when I first met Helen, it just transported me to being a little girl growing up in the 1970s in Australia and having such a clear memory of how her music used to change the women around me, my mother, her friends, these women who were my role models at the time. And a lot of them, because of the era, were mostly homemakers and mothers and not necessarily out there doing the kind of careers that a lot of women are doing now. But I just so clearly remember when this, when I'm woman and a lot of other Helen songs used to come on the radio, I'd be sitting in the back of my parents' Volvo station wagon and suddenly, you know, my mom and her friend, they'd let down their hair, they'd unwind the window and they'd be putting their fists up in the air. And I, I think I always equated Helen's music with change, the, the way I saw it change women. And that's a story I really wanted to tell. Jim, as one of Helen's closest friends, were you apprehensive when you first learned that a movie was going to be made about Helen's life? Honestly, yes. And I've told Andrew this. I wasn't sure exactly how it was going to be done. And I was afraid that it would be sort of capitalizing on parts of her life there weren't the most positive things for her. But I have to tell you, at the premiere in Toronto, I said to them, I was afraid you might screw this up and I didn't know what I would say. Well, you did not screw it up. You know, Jim and I actually first met when we were researching the movie. So Helen did her last ever concert in Las Vegas. And I took the writer Emma Jensen with me and we flew out there and we really wanted to see this last concert of Helen's. And it was on her very last night and we were all backstage with Helen and Jim and, you know, lots of people that love her. And, and that's where we first met Jim. And then you became involved in the film as well, didn't you, Jim? Well, I, Jordan had told me that they were working on an idea for a movie with Anju. And he asked me if I would be willing to help if they needed me. And of course, my answer to that was yes. So basically anything they asked for that I had or that I could provide, I was thrilled to do it. And Emma Jensen, who wrote the screenplay, was absolutely wonderful. They all were. I mean, I worked with several people from the production team, and it was just something that I thought was a, a chance of a lifetime. We were extremely lucky because Jim had all these things that we needed that we would have had to recreate. And in fact, Jim sent us the... The, the gold records in the in the movie that you see are actually Helen's real gold records. A lot of people don't realize that. And we were only able to have those on screen because of Jim. And I think you even sent us one of Helen's dresses. I did. Yeah. Which miraculously actually fit Tilda Cobb and Harvey. Can you imagine? Like perfectly, like a glove. But unfortunately, there wasn't. It was white. Yes. So the color palette didn't quite work for us. 
but it really helped Tilda. She was so excited to actually be when it, wearing one of Helen's real dresses. The inter- another interesting thing about sending those gold records is I was really nervous about it because they were going to be mailed to Australia. So Mark, my husband, built wooden crates to mail them in. So they got there safely. We had instructions on the outside how to open them to make sure that the right side was up and everything worked out perfectly. Now, Anju, the casting of the role of Helen Reddy was obviously a huge challenge. How in the world did you find Tilda Cobham Hervey? She's absolutely perfect in the role. I think she should have won an Oscar for it. Oh, I think Tilda did an extraordinary, extraordinary job. And it was really the key to making this movie. I knew that I really needed to find the right actor. And we took our time and we really did a very, very big search So we had casting directors looking in four or five different countries. I met with several people. And I guess one of the things that I might not have talked about a lot before, but I'd love to share with you, Harvey, is that a part of me sometimes worried about, you know, when you make a film and it's an independent film, they really want you to have some kind of name attached to Mm -hmm. the movie because it helps you get the movie made. But a part of me worried about that a little bit because I kept, thinking, you know, I don't want somebody to be watching somebody who's very recognizable and not be able to completely, you know, me, you know, really believe that that's Helen on the screen. So what I was really look, looking for in the end was I was looking for an actor who had the spirit of Helen, not necessarily had to identically look like Helen, because I know there's a lot that you can do. Like Tilda had, she'd had, she had an incredible hair and makeup team. You know, she had a false chin in there. She even was wearing false teeth. So there were a lot of things that we could do to tweak uh, physical elements. And of course, then Tilda embraced the physicality by doing a lot of voice work, choreography, movement classes. She sang to me every single day and really worked on those elements. But I think that as a director, what you're really looking for when you're casting for a biopic is you're really looking to capture the spirit of who that person is, not necessarily a cookie cutter replica Mm. of that person. And I actually think that was probably the best move that could have been made. Tilda is an absolutely wonderful actress to begin with, but she watched a lot of Helen videos so she could work on the movements. And there were times during the movie when I'm sitting there watching the movie and I'm thinking, that's Helen. It was that real, especially yeah. the performing but aspect even, of it. Even though she watched a lot of videos, I think what's really interesting is that she's not trying to mimic Helen. You know, she'll have certain mannerisms that are inspired by Helen, and especially in Angie Baby. Oh, you know, absolutely. all the hat, you and I can do all the, the choreography. I'm sure you can too, Harvey. Yeah. We'll spare you that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think she was really channeling her perfectly. Yes, because she really got to understand who the spirit of this person is. And I think that all the actors in the movie really embraced that. I mean, Evan Peters as Jeff Wall did exactly the same thing. And together they really supported each other by being able to be very present on camera and really being able to work off each other. And I think that that's what you respond to as much as you respond to the things that you may remember about Helen, you're responding to the relationship between the people on the screen. Now, other than the opening song, You're My World, which is sung by Helen Reddy, all of the other songs in the film are sung by Chelsea Cullen, who's practically channeling Helen as well. Why was it decided not to use Helen's real voice? So, It it was not possible to use Helen's voice throughout the whole film because the film is, in my mind, very much played like a musical. So some of Helen's songs were going to have to be changed to capture the emotion of the moment. So we actually changed up. You'll go back and if you watch some of the songs, the, the rhythm of the songs have been changed. And they needed to feel live. They needed to feel that when... Tilda is singing as Helen, they needed to really feel that you're watching that as a live performance, not as a recorded performance. And the performances that we have of Helen are mostly recorded. And we couldn't necessarily capture the emotion in those recorded performances. And also in the, even though there are some wonderful live recordings of Helen, they weren't necessarily spot on with where we needed the character of Helen to be emotionally at that moment. So we did a big search again for the right voice 
to fit Tilda and to, for you to really believe that that is the voice coming out of Tilda's body. It's really interesting. If you were to listen to Tilda's, uh, Chelsea's voice separately and you watched Tilda separately, it's not like they fully capture Helen on their own. But when you marry them together, you really capture the feeling of Helen and the performance might not be spot on to Helen, but again, Chelsea very much captured the spirit of how Helen performs. And most importantly, what Chelsea did is she told the story. And that's what Helen is so beautiful at doing. And that's why we all respond so well to her music because Helen was an extraordinary storyteller. So just a little interesting fact, there are um, more than one song in the movie that is actually Helen's real voice. So there are actually three songs in the movie that are sung by the real Helen Reddy. So it's uh, You're My World at the Beginning. And that was very important for me. I really wanted to start with Helen's voice because I think that for a lot of people, they really remember her voice so well. Her voice is unique. It's Mm -hmm. iconic. And what having Helen's voice at the beginning of the movie does is it really allows you to believe you're entering Helen's world and Everybody knows that that's her voice. You'll see there's actually quite a big gap between that first song and when Tilda starts to sing. And that's also done a little deliberately. So you're not, you know, you're not butting up the two voices right next to each other. So every time Tilda physically sings and you see her singing on the screen, that's Chelsea's voice. Every other song that is not sung by Tilda is actually Helen's voice. So the other two songs are Love Song for Jeffrey and no way to treat a lady. Treat a lady. I, I also think that the fact that that uh, the spirit of of Tilda was so apparent, and when that song "You're My World" swells onto the screen at the beginning, it's like the expectation of this story is going to swell with that song, like that song did, and that for me captured the essence of of the building of the drama in the story. Yeah, and you know what? We almost didn't get the permission to use the song. It was actually literally like maybe on the second last day of doing our sound mix, we found out we had permission to actually use the song in the movie. It was very complicated to clear with all the rights and our music supervisor and our producer, Rosemary Blight, I mean, they just did such a phenomenal song job of pushing to try and get that song into the movie it was a it was very very challenging for, and and they kept people kept saying to me you know you're gonna have to think of something else to put there and I just hung on to the very end because in my heart I always knew that was perfect there that was perfect there that was oh absolutely. it was absolutely perfect there it totally set the stage now Jim you're the president of Helen's fan club what has been the reaction of the fans to the movie It's been incredible. Everybody has been very supportive. The only thing, and it's minor, is that people want a documentary about Helen, and so do I, but that movie was not intended to be a documentary. It was telling a story, and it would not have worked to tell Helen's entire life in two hours. It's just not possible. So I think the way the movie was done told the story of the three periods in her life wonderfully and i would love for somebody to make a documentary are you looking at this you're looking at me jim (laughs) you know i actually think it's wonderful that there there's room now for more things to be made about helen she had an extraordinary life and this movie really when we were creating it it was really clear that there were very definite things that we had to make choices about and i think one of the really important things for me in making this movie was legacy And it was really showing what the legacy of Helen's music and her life has been. So it really built to the end point. So there were many aspects of Helen's life that we were simply not able to cover. We weren't able to cover her early life. We weren't able to cover her family in show business, which is such a fascinating Mm -hmm. story. And we weren't able to cover a lot of the music that she did with other musicians, Glenn Campbell, the Bee Gees. I mean, how many, like she even performed with Kiss, is that right? Yes, with Gene Simmons. I mean, incredible. But we weren't able to cover all those elements because one, we didn't have time. And on a film of this size, we 
couldn't really afford to include all those other musicians. Every time you play music in a film, it's very expensive. So I'm really excited that this movie opened the doors for a whole new generation to love and appreciate Helen, but also I hope it also opens the doors for more things to be made about Helen. One of the things that it's done already is brought I Am Woman back into the spotlight, the song. There have been at least four other versions recorded. I posted several of them on the Facebook page to lead up to today of Helen's recording of it. And some, uh, I, the, the uh, interest in the song is so strong. I hear about, I've never heard the song before, or my mother used to play this and now I understand why. Those stories are, are being told by a completely new generation. And that really warms my heart. And do you know, Javi, do you know, Javi, that when the film opened in Australia, it was the first time in Australian music history that both a grandmother and a granddaughter both had a song in the top 10 in Australia, Helen with I'm Woman. In fact, almost all her songs charted yes. in that week when the film opened. And then Lily, who is her granddaughter and a wonderful singer, we put her in the movie as part of the legacy of Helen and her music. And the original song that she sings, Revolution, also charted in that same week. I think that's amazing. It is. It's really, it's just so appropriate for Helen. Now, Anju, I understand that you showed the movie to Helen before it premiered at the Toronto Film Festival in 2019. Can you take us back to that day and tell us what it was like to watch this film with Helen Reddy? Well, we showed the film to Helen before we finished the movie. And I thought that was very important. You know, Helen had been on this journey of the film, you know, from the very, very beginning. The film pretty much started off with me, Helen and Jordan. You know, for the first year, it was just the three of us. You know, Jordan was really helping me find material and Helen and I were doing a lot of conversations. We were taking walks and sometimes the little things that she'd say at lunch or when we're walking on the beach, sparked an idea that I would research more. So Helen had been very supportive from the very beginning. She didn't originally want to make a, a film. And you, you can understand why, because we all know that Helen, I think that a film meant that it, it couldn't encompass everything that Helen thinks is important for her. Well, and even though she was a very public figure, she was a very private person. Yes. So yes, she was. You put uh, that so beautifully. She was a very private person. So what did she think of the film? Oh, so she um, she had read the script, and the family had made a couple of small comments, nothing really major. I think the more interesting conversation is what did Jeff Wall think of the script? Oh, I'll get um, to that. Believe yes. me. <laughs> but but I think that when we showed the movie, we decided that I wanted to ha have like a moment before we finish editing the movie because I felt it was really important to address something if Helen felt very strongly about it. So we did a screening here in Los Angeles at the Dick Clark screening room and we did two separate screenings, one for Helen and Tracy and Jordan and, and Tracy's husband and the second screening was for Jeff and Deborah, his wife, and I was super, super nervous, especially with the screening with Helen because I was so busy at the time, I hadn't really thought about, thought it really through in my head. And then all of a sudden I realized I'm sitting in the theater, the lights go down and there is the real Helen Reddy sitting in front of me and she's about to watch a movie through my eyes. I just started to panic a little bit because we all know that Helen likes to say it as, as she thinks, don't you think? Oh, she Jim? does, yes. Absolutely. Like if Helen does not like something, she will let you know. So I was so caught up in the movie making that I just in that moment started to panic. But in that same moment, I realized that Helen was laughing and singing, singing along to her songs. She was very engaged in the story. And that really made me feel so much more comfortable because I realized that, the, that she was enjoying the movie. And at the end of the movie, the end title cards came up and she actually read each of the title cards out aloud. And when she read the last one about the Equal Rights Amendment never being passed in the US Constitution, she paused and then she started to cry. And it was 
so incredibly moving for all of us there. In this moment, I felt that Helen had totally felt everything about the movie and she hugged her children and then she hugged me and, and then I felt really that I was going to continue with her blessing. In fact, we actually ended up changing very little after that screening. Wow. Well, congratulations. That's quite a tribute to you. Now, you know, Helen wrote a memoir entitled The Woman I Am. Anju, were you influenced by her book in the way that you directed the film? Well, when I first met Helen, she had told me her story in person. So we had spent a couple of, we, we met at an, uh, an event in, in Los Angeles. It was the Australian Good Day Australia Ball. You know, it's sort of, I always talk about the fact that when I realized it was Helen Reddy, I made my husband swap seats with me because I really wanted to talk with her. So she had told me a lot about her story. And then we met a couple of times afterwards. And then I read her book. And I found her book really fascinating because there were other layers of her life and of her that I thought were just really, they really kind of explained so much to me about Helen. So we really used the book as, as a resource in terms of what, what you know, in getting, understanding her better as a person. And I certainly know uh, Tilda also read the book, but the movie is very specific, covers very specific areas of her life. And so we had to really find the journey for the movie. And there were small things that she told me, for example, one day we were having lunch and we were talking about Lillian Roxon. And she told me something very, very small, which then made me think, oh, it's very, this relationship with her, with Lillian was actually very pivotal to Helen. She doesn't talk about it. She talks about it in the book, but not in the same way that we capture in the movie. And in the movie, it's a work of fiction. It's a fictionalized account of Helen's life. So there are things that happen in the movie that might not have exactly happened like that in the book. But a lot of everything was grounded in reality. And I do remember saying to Helen, you know, because at first we had talked about possibly doing a documentary, but when we when it was really clear to me that we needed to make this dramatized version of her life, and in some ways to help reach a bigger audience, I thought that that was part of it as well. I did say to Helen, you know, Helen, I'm never going to get every part of your right in this, uh, this every part of your life right in this film. I won't get every, everything you've said correct. I may not even get the sequence of events correct. But one thing I promise you, Helen, is that I will absolutely honour the spirit of who you are, what your life has been, and what your music means to people. And I think that that absolutely was achieved. And I think that meant a lot to Helen to trust her story to someone who was going to treat it with that respect. Oh, and boy, did you ever. And you also respected her fans, Anju, who followed her career so loyally, who knew every note and every lick of every song. You really paid tribute to her in a way that we as fans felt very respected and validated. And I thank you for oh. that. I'm so glad to hear that. You know, we actually did a lot of research on the fans as well, not only talking to Jim, but we spoke to other people. And I, we found this incredible book that somebody had put together that Jordan had given us. And it was literally a book that one of the fans had followed Helen's career all through the 70s and 80s and created this extraordinary scrapbook where she had also written everything that she'd experienced with Helen as well. So we actually did a lot of research with the fans. And because I know how important it is, how important her music and her story was to the fans, you know, I actually really held on to a lot of songs in the movie and made sure that we played them in full because I knew that that is part of the experience of watching a Helen Reddy biopic. You know, I felt that you really needed the whole song, not just, mm -hmm. you know, as in some of the musical biopics, you don't, you often don't have time. So you're always told just to, you know, encourage just to use the small section of the song. But I think that it really, for me, it was quite wonderful to be able to play them in full and to have that whole performance experience because that's part of who she is. It wasn't just the story of her marriage and her career and what she did for the women's movement. The movie is very much a part 
about Helen the performer as well. When Helen retired the first time in her last show in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada with the Edmonton Symphony, she thanked the fans for the for their loyalty and she had there was about 37 of us there from 13 states and three countries. She asked us to stand up and she thanked us for the loyalty and for the fact that we have stuck with her through thick and thin. So I think absolutely using the full song in the movie gave the fans and speaking for the ones that I have heard from and I've heard from thousands that they appreciated that. I appreciated that it, because it didn't short shrift Helen. It let her express the whole thought that she was trying to express in a song. Yeah, you know, I, I think I got very lucky in the time that I met Helen because it was also, she had just moved back to Los Angeles and she went, she did like a last series of concerts. At the time, we didn't know they were her last series, but we were all super excited because she was back at the Catalina Lounge in Los Angeles and she was performing in Vegas and I actually got to meet, I went to a lot of her shows and I got to meet a lot of the fans and that really helped shape the kind of story that I wanted to tell. It really helped shape the kind of movie that we wanted to show. And one of the most meaningful screenings for me after we started to release the film was we were in New York together oh, yes. at the Athena Film Festival where the movie was the opening night film. We had our New York premiere and it was so amazing because Jim and so many of the fans flew to New York and that was really one of the most special screenings, wasn't it? Jim? Oh, it was wonderful. And to, to cap that night off at the party afterwards, we were at a club called Mel's Burger Bar, which is absolutely wonderful. And at the end of the evening, they played I Am Woman, Helen's version of it. And the entire crowd that was there, there were probably maybe 300 people were singing to the, you know, at the top of our lungs, I am woman. It felt so, so right to be closing the evening that way. Yes, I, think I've got a, I've, I only managed to capture a little snippet of it. I think I've got it on my Instagram page, but it was so beautiful. And then ironically, literally after that screening, the world shut down with COVID. Like the next week. Yeah, you're giving me goosebumps just thinking about it. But now you knew this was coming, Anju. I'm, I can't avoid this question. Helen's manager and ex-husband, Jeff Wald, was certainly not portrayed in a very positive light in the second half of the film, primarily because of his drug addiction. What was his reaction to the movie? I think what's amazing about Jeff, who I got to know very well and and I was initially nervous about meeting Jeff, but I think that one of the things I really admire about Jeff is that Jeff has totally owned the experiences that he's had, the faults that have happened. He really has owned his mistakes. And I think that's an incredible thing to do as a human being. He was also extremely open and honest about everything that happened in his relationship with Helen. And we actually developed the screenplay for at least a full year before I ever met Jeff. And I think that was really, really important because this is Helen's story. And Jeff is such a big person and such a big character and, and people, you know, have very strong memories of Jeff that I thought it was really important for Emma and I to really focus on making the film about Helen initially. And then after a while, after about a year, I actually got a phone call from Jordan saying, Jeff wants to meet you. And I, I'll be really honest. I was a little nervous because I kept thinking, if it doesn't go well with Jeff, this film could be in trouble. So I went to the restaurant that he wanted. I sat at the table that he asked me to sit at. And I went there. He was, I got there early. I remember he was 20 minutes late, but I was like 20 minutes almost early because I was really anxious about it. And he sat down. It was about, mm, I think about 20 past one when we sat down. I did not leave the table until seven o'clock that night. Really? He was so generous and so really had so many incredible things to tell me. And I think that part of wanting to meet me because I, I really came to learn that even though he and Helen had had so many differences and at that stage when I met Jeff, I don't even think they were really communicating that much, but which of course then changed over the years that I got to know them. 
But what really struck me about Jeff is that he is the antagonist in the in many ways in this movie. But it really struck me that while I was telling his story, that he spent a lot of time taking care of Helen. He wanted to make sure things went well for Helen. And even in this movie, Jeff was or seemed a lot of the time concerned about how this would impact Helen and impact his children. So he wasn't thinking about himself as much, but he was very open and very honest about who he was and the part that he played in her career and what happened in their marriage. I really have to say, I really came to admire that. And Jeff saw the movie. He was, he's been incredibly supportive. At the end of the screening, he turned around and, I, and you know, I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but he had tears in his eyes. And he was very moved and he's been at, he came to the Los Angeles premiere at the American Film Institute. We were the, a special screening on their closing night of the festival. And he came and he supported the movie. Even when people were asking questions about him and mm. all the craziness, he was there really supporting it. I really have to admire that. And now, I, I have brilliant. to say, you've, you've, you've really touched me. I, Look, the the fact is the man was a drug addict and he stole all her money. Uh, it doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy towards him. And yet what you're saying gives me the sense that there is not only an acknowledgement of really serious wrongdoing and mismanagement, but regret, remorse. Well, I think it's he he accepts the responsibility and he accepts his part in in the problem itself. Just to give you, Jeff is one of those people that is not, he does not hold back his opinion, but he also, when he cares about you, he cares about you. Just to give you an example, last, my birthday last July, I got a very nice message from him that out of the blue, and I, it was very touching. I, I will never forget that. Jim, you knew Jeff back in the 70s. What's your reaction to the portrayal of Jeff Wald in the film? Well, I was telling Andrew this the other day. I, I, I thought it was fair and I thought it was, it was, it's Jeff. I mean, the good, the bad, and the, the ugly, it's Jeff. The, uh, but knowing Jeff so well and knowing the story so well, there were some scenes that were difficult to watch, but they were difficult to watch because they were based in fact. In fact, a lot of those scenes were scenes that Jeff told me. So a lot of those scenes about Jeff would not exist in the movie unless he had actually shared the stories. And, and I think the demise of their relationship, I came to understand, was a lot more complex and complicated than Jeff, you know, yes, the drugs played a big part of it, but losing the money was a lot more complex and complicated than Jeff, just Jeff spending it. I think there were a lot more layers to it. We don't go into it a lot more, and maybe a documentary would, would question that more, but I think that in this movie, it was really about the breakdown of a marriage. And what about the two children? How have they reacted to the film? Both Tracy and Jordan have been incredibly supportive. I mean, as I said, this movie started with just Helen, me and Jordan. And Jordan really facilitated so many amazing introductions and really helped me convince Helen that this should be a movie, not a documentary. And then at some point along the way, uh, Tracy got more involved as well, which was, you know, really helped give us another side to the family and to um, and to seeing how she and the journey that she and Helen had been on together. That really struck me as a woman, as a mother, you know, the movie pretty much starts and ends with the two of them. And when I started to really look into Helen's life, I just could not get over the fact, we all know the story of being a superstar and the heights of fame that she reached and things that she did for the women's movement and the legacy that she leaves behind. But as a woman, I think, how did she do that? Like she arrived in New York at the age of 25 with a three-year-old child. She had, there were scenes where I kept thinking, well, who looks out when she's performing, when she's going to work, who looks after the child? You know, the practicalities of it all. I think it's really quite amazing the journey the two of them went on. And Tracy and Jordan both gave me really great insight into their family, into both the parents. I mean, one of the things that Tracy spoke to me about that we had not really thought about with Jeff is that initially, I, I have to say that before I met Jeff, Jeff was a lot tougher as a character. 
But once I met Jeff and realized how incredibly charismatic he is, and then Tracy said to something to me at lunch one day, she said to me, one of my overriding memories, I said, what's, what, what's one of your biggest memories of Jeff? And she told me this great story of how he, she came home one day and there was a motorbike sitting in the living room, like, like in the middle of the living room and that she got on it and he drove around the living room and it just made me think, oh my gosh, he was so much fun. And he was so kind of, you know, mad with, with the enthusiasm and, that's an element of the character that I think Evan Peters captured really well because you have to really believe in this movie and in this story and understand why Helen stays with him for so long mm -hmm. and why she loves him. And part of it is that he is so charismatic. He is so, you know, he did really put her first for such a long time until the drugs, you know, kind of took over. Well, you know, I love the fact that this isn't simply a biopic about a popular singer. The movie makes an important statement about feminism and the women's rights movement. Isn't it amazing that Helen's story resonates so powerfully all these years later when we're still dealing with the struggle for equality and the Me Too movement? Absolutely. And I think that is so obvious when you see the women's marches and you see signs that say things like, I am woman, hear me roar. We are invincible and things like that. That to me says more about the legacy of that song than anything else. It's not done yet. Yes, and that's why we set the last scene of the movie at the 1989 Right to Life March. That was a very important moment in Helen's life, but I felt that particularly when I had, was making the movie and the women's movement, the women's marches had started, I felt that it was really, it would be feel very contemporary for an audience because that would be something that they would really understand and relate to. I was actually at the Women's March in Washington. And part of the, apart from wanting to go there and support rights for women, I was also there because I wanted to stand at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and look out on a sea of people in the way that Helen did at the end of the movie. And I knew in my heart, I think, that we would never get to shoot in Washington. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go there and experience it for myself and know what we were trying to recreate. And I sat on the steps. I stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Like, literally, I'd been at the Women's March. There must have been over a million women on the streets. It was really quite amazing. And as I stood on the steps, and, and unfortunately, I couldn't use any of the material because everybody was in pink hats, and obviously they <laughs> weren't in 1989. But as I stood on the steps, I saw somebody walk past with a sign saying, hear me roar. And I just thought, wow, that's just so perfect and so amazing. I took a photo of that. And that photo that I took actually is in the end title cards of the movie. One of the, I think it was the New York Post had one of those signs on the cover and I took it to show Helen and when she saw the sign, she started to cry. And it was, that was a very powerful moment, I think for her, it certainly was for me. Again, the, the song is still having an impact and those words that she wrote all those years ago are just as powerful now as they were then. And look it's at the- more powerful. And look at the Facebook page that you managed, Jim. You're managing the official Helen Reddy fan club page. You must be thrilled to see the ever increasing numbers of new fans following the Facebook page, all because they fell in love with Helen through this beautiful movie. I am thrilled beyond words. And especially, I mean, I, I welcome everybody there, but especially little girls who are writing to me, telling me that the movie meant so much to them or Helen meant so much to them. Oh, here we go because she meant so much to me and I, I identify with that feeling. And I just, I think it's one of the most powerful messages that's come out of all of this for me. So what's next for Anju Moon? Is it true you're going to be directing Frankly in Love based on the David Yoon novel? I am. I'm so excited about the book. It's, I saw, I met David Yoon the other day and I just think he's written such a special, amazing book that in its own way is very, you know, it touches on such really important themes of our lives right now. So you must, you're really incredible. You did an amazing documentary on Tony Bennett. You've now done a feature film dramatization of Helen Reddy's life. You're now moving on to do the David Yoon novel. 
I'm telling you, uh, we're going to be watching you at the Oscars in well, short order. You know, at the end of the day, I think I just really want to, I'm attracted to things and I want to make things that I want to see on the screen. And sometimes I think that I go to the cinema and I don't see anything on the screen sometimes that I want to watch. I'm not really great with violence. I'm not really great with a lot of blood and gore. <laughs> and and I love going to the cinema or I love watching something at home and just really walking away feeling uplifted and feeling like I've really experienced a different world. And so I think I got super, super lucky and blessed, as I said at the beginning, that when I met Helen, I knew, I knew instantly in my heart that I was going to make this movie. And I'm so glad that Helen came on this journey with me. Oh, and so is everyone else. And I love that you're Australian. I think that really matters in this case. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> well, the thing is that, you know, she and I had a lot, a lot in common because, you know, she actually paved the way for somebody like me. So, look, we come from very different cultural backgrounds, but we both grew up in Australia and we both really had a dream of having a bigger voice artistically on the world stage and both felt that coming to America would be how we would achieve that. And so I could not have done what I'm doing now without her breaking those barriers for women, breaking those barriers for artists, breaking those barriers for Australians to be able to make this kind of a journey. Well, Anju, thank you so much for making a movie that was so heartfelt and truly immortalizes the iconic and legendary Helen Reddy. And Jim, thank you so much for everything you do to celebrate and preserve Helen's incredible legacy. To both of you, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come on our show. Well, it's truly my pleasure. And I'm so excited that I got to do it with Jim together. It's so nice. We work well together. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm delighted. It was like a, a double blessing to have you both on the show. And Anju, I can't wait to see your next film. I hope you'll come back on our show to talk about it, please. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you so much. Our guests have been filmmaker Anju Moon discussing her film, I Am Woman, and Jim Keaton, president of the official Helen Reddy fan club. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.